and I became one of the first merchants to use Shopify. And then after I finished law school and business school, I realized that that experience, that thing that Shopify gave me uh, as a merchant, which was independence, it was self-identity, it was all these amazing things. I wanted to help uh, give that to other people. And uh, that was about 12 years ago. And today we, we have more than 1.7 million stores on Shopify. About 9% 9, 9 of all e-commerce in the U.S. goes through Shopify. And if you've had a great experience buying from a great direct-to-consumer uh, independent brand, there's a really good chance that Shopify powers that online store. Hey, this is Harley Finkelstein. I'm the president of Shopify. And you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. are blown up it's amazing um i want to go back in the chronology a little bit and i, I like to ask this question uh what did you want to be when you grow up because i think there's two camps of people you know uh to simplify things right now let's let's sort of in, put it in the context of young people who are coming out of school fig, trying to figure out what they want to do with their life and then also you know since we're going through this pandemic you know there's been this great upheaval it reminds me a lot of 2008 to be honest um i started this little production company right at the tip of the spear uh, at the Great Recession, mm -hmm. and it feels very familiar. <laughs> a lot of people, I think, are resetting their lives and their career. Um, either they're downsized or they need to shift. So what did you, what were you thinking about? What was young Harley thinking about when, when he was growing up? This is going to be weird, uh, but... I, uh, I'm, I'm Jewish. And when you were a 13 year old Jewish kid, you go to a lot of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and, and, uh, you're in LA. So I know there's lots of bar mitzvahs happening and bat mitzvahs happening in Los Angeles, a uh, big Jewish community. But when you're 13, you start going, you're spending your weekends at these sort of, uh, these events and these parties. And some are really big and lavish and some are very small and very modest. But I always looked at the DJ or the DJ booth, um, as this sort of magical box that here you had a bunch of people. Uh, uh, you know, 200 people, 1,000 people, or even 50 people at this, as guests of the, of the party who are sitting there wearing suits and ties. They're uncomfortable. They're eating rubber chicken in some, you know, kind of, in many cases, dilapidated or, or just kind of uninspired venue, uh, some, some sort of hall. And yet, with a matter of a couple touches of certain buttons and a couple different phrases uh, with certain voice inflection, the DJ is able to take that crowd and completely change the energy in the room, completely inject uh, this incredible entropy into this party, into these people. And like, inside, if you're good at it, three minutes later, you have every single person in that room, I don't know, doing a conga line or something. And that I thought was just so compelling and so inspiring that by the use of music and, and your words and this sort of aggregated um you know shtick that djs have you can change 200 people's minds instantaneously and so that's what i want to do i want to be uh it, it's funny at the time i thought i wanted to be a dj what, what it turns out is what i love doing is inspiring people is getting people that um may not necessarily know what they're capable of and trying to get them to see a better version of themselves if possible and then it was djing and, and actually now i do the almost the same thing except by, 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 I, I use entrepreneurship as that vehicle, but you know, hardly at 13 years old, want to be a DJ more than anything in the world. That's awesome. While you're talking, unfortunately, my filmmaker mind was laying down a drum beat as you were speaking. And I was also, uh, unfortunately imagining you with the Steve Aoki hair, um, <laughs> <laughs> throwing cakes or something like that. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, but I actually see it. So Hardy, are, you're an, you're an extrovert. Yeah. I am. Big time. Yeah, yeah I uh, can, I can Tim, Tim Ferriss referred to a, a very close friend. He refers to me as a power extrovert, which I think is a probably uh, a good uh, is, is the right nomenclature. Mm, never heard of him. Who are you talking about? Kidding. Um, yeah, well, I, I recognize you because I am an introvert. Or maybe Susan Cain, who wrote that book, Quiet, a book for introverts. Uh, she also has a hybrid category, which is ambivert. I am an ambivert at times, so sometimes I do like to be the life of the party. I am, I am that DJ guy, 
but also sometimes I am that introvert. So um, I see you. I see you. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I'm curious about if you had influence from your parents. Like, did they say, Harley, we want you to get a real job, like go be a doctor or a plumber or open a flower shop or become an airplane pilot? Like, was there any sort of deliberate steering into one direction? You know, I mean, the, I, I have two two daughters. Uh, my wife and I have two kids now. Uh, Zoe is two and, and Bailey is four. And I've been thinking a lot about that question because you sort of think about, you know, how were you raised relative to how you want to raise your children? And, and what are the things that you want to take with you and, 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 and instill in your children that you thought was a very positive part of your own upbringing versus what are the things that like you don't want to, you know, you don't want your kids to adopt because frankly, that, that, was, that, that wasn't valuable or helpful to anybody. My, my dad's an immigrant. Uh, he immigrated to Canada uh, in 1956 during the Hungarian Revolution. And um, when him and his siblings and his mom and dad landed in Canada from Hungary, uh, it was a rough time for them. They had no money. They didn't speak English. They had no skills, transferable skills or degrees or anything like that, no education. And so they, my grandfather ended up setting up a little egg a stall at a farmer's market selling eggs. And he did that for like 65 years, his entire life he spent uh, selling eggs at the same farmer's market in Montreal. It's called the Jean Talon Farmer's Market. And that egg stand still stands today. It's called Le Capitaine. Uh, and it's, 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 it's remarkable that it's been around for so long. But they used, you know, my, my father watched my grandfather put food on the table on a roof over the, heads, the head of their family, uh, roof over their heads for the family by virtue of, of small business. And so when I became... Um, when my, I think my parents saw me being entrepreneurial, again, you know, going back to the DJ thing, I didn't want to start a DJ company. I just wanted to DJ. But I recognized that I was 13. I looked like I was 10. And no one really, you know, I had no DJ skills. There was no way someone could hire me. I was impossible to hire. So I had to start my own DJ company and hire myself. And I think as soon as my dad and mom started seeing that, they were very encouraging. Unfortunately, they didn't have much money. So there was no way for them to help fund me. They couldn't give me a loan of, you know, five or $10,000. They couldn't help pay for stuff. What they did though, that I think was um, really in hindsight, incredibly valuable was every little small, silly company that I wanted to start or that I, that I had started, they made me a business card for that company. And that business card tactic or strategy was incredibly valuable because it gave me this great validation. It gave me, it put some wind in my sails. It made me confident that maybe this isn't such a silly idea. And it, that's right. Yeah. It gave me some legitimacy and, and, and made me sort of think about, Hey, this, this can be right. And, and again, most of the companies that I started, uh, were huge failures. And, and as entrepreneurs, we don't often talk about that, but it's important, you know, two things that entrepreneurship I think is, is, is not honest about all the time. One is as, as much as we're making it easier and leveling the playing field with great software like Shopify, entrepreneurship is still really, really difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and the second thing is that we as successful entrepreneurs in, in, in particular, we don't actually talk about our failures as much as we do our big hits. So having going from you know, little DJ company to little slipper company to selling, you know, uh, sports cards and trading sports cards, whatever it was that I that I was sort of hustling. My dad and mom made me these very simple business cards, and that gave me great validation. And that in itself encouraged me to always think differently about my life. I, again, I, you know, I mentioned law school. I, when I was 21, I was finishing undergrad. I had, I had a t-shirt business that was, you know, was, it, was, it was doing okay. I was making promotional t-shirts for universities. But I realized that I was missing something. I, I wasn't able to. I had no competitive advantage. Uh, there was no moat around the business. And so in the same way that I was able to disrupt other companies, Anyone can disrupt me. And, and, and from year to year, I basically had to restart my sales cycle. So I wanted to have a little bit more sophistication around business and, and building companies. And a mentor of mine convinced me to go to law school. And so even that approach, I got to law school, I felt like a complete outsider because here there's all these very smart people that want big jobs at big law firms and want to you know argue before the Supreme Court. And all I was trying to do in law school was acquire new skills how to write better, how to think better, how to be more articulate, how to negotiate, how to critical reason, all those things. And, and my parents were always very supportive of, of, of those sort of more entrepreneurial tactics to life. The only thing they were uncompromising about was if you do something, you have to do it well. If I'm going to be a janitor, I need to be the best janitor. If I'm going to be uh, an executive of a big company, I should be the best executive of, of, of the best company. And so that is a lot of that instilled me with this level of ambition that 
you know, I, I, I still bring, I think, uh, every day to, to my work. And, and then maybe the last thing I'd probably say on my parents is that my parents never sort of looked at work and life as being two separate buckets. Um, my, I always sort of viewed life and work as sort of one that the Venn diagram of your personal interests can and should overlap with the Venn diagram of, of, of your professional interests. And if your hobby and your nine to five or whatever you want to call it has some really good similarities, you're probably as close to life's work as you're going to find and encounter. And that I think is the greatest way to spend your time. Um, especially if it does something that is meaningful to you, which for me is spreading entrepreneurship and inviting more people into this idea of starting a business. Harley, so good. Um, it's like you already know my playbook. You already know what's in my mind. I don't have a script here. I have notes as you're talking uh, because you're you're sparking some ideas, things that I want to unpack a little bit more or maybe uh, a follow-up question, but like literally you've just like ticked several of the boxes uh, of where I wanted to go. So thank you for all that. That's a, a wealth of information. And for any of the audience who may have missed some of these things, uh, let me just underscore a few things that, he, that Harley just said. Um, it strikes me that you talk about Montreal, which is just over the over the water from Ottawa, where you are now. Um, it doesn't seem like you have moved very far from maybe where you that little egg farm <laughs> started. Um, I've been to Ottawa. My experience with in Ottawa was amazing. I was there uh, doing a commercial uh, film project, and I remember running around the edge of the water at Ottawa, right sort of where the Capitol building is, mm -hmm. and seeing these beavers, <laughs> like like as big as dogs, crawling out of the water thinking, am I safe? <laughs> uh, that same day, uh, I discovered Canada's uh, number two most popular sport. Do you know what that is after hockey? After hockey, uh, uh, number two, curling? Ultimate Frisbee. Oh, I didn't actually know that. That was a, That's interesting. I didn't know this was the second most popular. <laughs> and yeah. people, the, a bunch of college people were playing it on the, on the lawn of the Capitol building there. I got invited to play. That was a lot of fun. And then after we were playing, um, a parade came by. One of the most interesting parades, it was a nude parade, nudist parade. <laughs> the people that you uh, hope never get nude and ride a bicycle at the same time were the ones that were in that parade. That was interesting. Uh, that parade still happens every year in Ottawa. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting, to say the least, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then we, we went and got some, um, some donuts and... and Probably what? beaver tails, right? I mean, it was just, it was an amazing experience. I will never forget Otto. I was there for about two weeks and is super impressed um, with Montreal right across the, the pond there. All the historic, I mean, so what strikes me is that you didn't move very far. I want to talk about that. You know, why not take your big business to New York City or a big market like LA? Why stay in like a great little quaint, beautiful progressive town like Ottawa, but, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, minimize it, but why not move to like a big city town or the Silicon Valley to do something like that? Maybe that's my yeah. first question. Well, first of all, I think, so uh, one part of the story that I, I, I left out was I went to high school in South Florida. My parents moved to South Florida when I was about 14, uh, 13 or 14. And I, I lived there for all of high school uh, in South Florida. And then I moved back to Canada. So actually I, I, I didn't, I wasn't given a choice to move to South Florida. My parents were like, we're moving. We moved. And then I moved back intentionally to go back to Canada. And part of it was for me, Canada felt, uh, I, I don't know who said this, but I, I think it's a really great way to put it. It feel Canada always felt to me like, uh, America for Europeans, that it had all of the ambition and all of the, um, big thinking that, is is so ingrained in the culture and the DNA of, of 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 the U.S. economy, but the U.S. society. But it also has a joie de vivre, which means you know a, a joy of life um, that it to me reflects you know, any of my time spending. In, I spent some time in Europe. Like there's there's a certain joie de vivre that also is here too. And so when you combine that ambition, that U.S. ambition that is so well known globally, with a little bit of the joie de vivre from Europe, I think you actually end up with Canada. And I, I love that. I thought that was a really great way for me to a really great place for me to be. But your your real question that I think is really interesting is is 
is business geographically agnostic, right? Uh, we are, Shopify is currently the, the largest company by market cap in Canada. We are one of the largest uh, companies uh, by market cap in technology around the world. Our market cap, you know, depending on the days, it's, it's above $100 billion, which is unbelievable. And and I, I say that like it, that means a lot to me, not because of the dollars and cents around it, but because it shows the impact that we're having. And I think that's that's an interesting thing. But when we were first raising our initial round of, of financing, our Series A back in 2010, there was this conversation. There was this pull to say, "Hey, look, you guys need to re, uh, you know, re, uh, you know, reconfigure your company in a place like Silicon Valley where the money is and the talent is." And I think we we just rejected that. We did not think that it was necessary for us to build a world class company from Silicon Valley. It was necessary for us to do it from L.A. or New York. We could do it from anywhere we wanted. And so, if you can do it from anywhere you want, why not pick a place where it's really comfortable, where lifestyle is really good, where you still have great access to talent? And and yeah, maybe it's tough to get people to move to Canada mid February when it's you know minus forty with the wind chill. But uh, there were more advantages and there were disadvantages. Uh, things like ten, average tenure, loyalty. Um, the people that have been at Shopify, I've been at Shopify for a very long time. I mean, for the most part, those of us that were there in the early days, we're, we're, st we're still around. And and we've we've upgraded our teams. We've all had to requalify for our jobs. But you don't see that average, that same average tenure in terms of um, people working at these companies in a place like Silicon Valley, where every you know year and a half or two and a half years uh, or three years, if you're thinking about a vesting schedule, people sort of look at, okay, well, where else can I go? I can go to this company or that company. And, and so we just decided that we thought we can build something really impactful and important from Ottawa at the same time, live in a place that we deeply, deeply enjoy. And I think today um, you see that happening. Companies, some of the best companies on the planet, aren't like technology companies, are not necessarily built in Silicon Valley. They're built in Australia, and they're built in New York City, and they're built in Toronto and Ottawa and in Europe. And you know, Spotify is based in Sweden. I mean, it, it just it doesn't matter where you're based. Now that being said, the advantages or the disadvantages of not being in a mega city. Um, you know, for example, access to capital, uh, that was difficult initially. It got a lot easier as you grow access to the greatest minds. We were talking about a, a friend of yours who now works at Shopify is a brilliant, one of the greatest growth, uh, marketers and growth hackers on the planet, Morgan. Um, you know, the fact that Morgan can come now work at Shopify and still live in Southern California, that is, is, is a lot of those disadvantages have disappeared. And the current state of the way Shopify thinks about location and geography is that we are now a digital by design company, meaning you can live anywhere you want, whether it's time zones are, are helpful, but it's not necessary, but you can live anywhere you want. As long as you have great internet access, you have a great setup. Uh, we're, we're okay with you living there. And what that does is it means that everyone now can customize their life and curate a lifestyle for themselves that fits their particular needs. And so in some cases, it's, hey, I want, you know, we were talking, you and I were talking about skateboarding. I love skateboarding. I want to be near a boardwalk. And so I'm going to live on, on Santa Monica Beach or I'm going to live in Venice. Um, if that's your thing and you're deeply passionate about that, you should do that. But if you have an elderly parent or a family member that you need to take care of, we don't think that you need to have that trade off, that you should be able to live where you need to live, but still have a great career and a great job at a place like Shopify. And so, um, I, I think that that's where things are going. I think one in the future, um, and it's already happening now, major cities will have less of a, of a monopoly on the best jobs. I think two, this idea that, uh, that, that you can work from anywhere, it's not going to be this pipe dream that's actually the case. Um, I think that the idea of customizing where you live and how you live is going to be something that most great people, most great um, members of, of, of these companies are going to demand. And I think it's it's working out. And so we're trying to be as thoughtful about this digital by design model as we were about building our amazing offices when we had them a couple of years ago. And I still think there's a place for in-person uh, you know, meetings and we'll still have time to get together for onboarding and team building and things of that nature. But I, I think that the 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 days of office, in office centricity, I think that's over. Some really good sound bites in there. Thank you again. Um, you also talked about, well, you sort of, you, you skimmed the water on nature versus nurture. I love that talk. <clears throat> Thank you for weighing in on that. Um, and then you also sort of covered the base on this idea that, that I'm always curious about, which is, 
should you pursue your passion, do what you love, or should you pursue what you're great at and learn to love it? And it sounds like that you are the former. I'm actually also in the camp of the former, um, that you should do what you love. Um, I'm good at lots of things. Um, I'm bad at a lot of things too, but <laughs> there are a few things that I'm good at that that I don't think that um, I have the passion uh, that can sustain me, you know? And uh, so I appreciate you weighing in because it sounds like, you know, you've really pursued, whether it's, you know, picking up signals, and signals are important too. Um, maybe I'll ask this question embedded in the last one, which is, how do you become self-aware? How do you identify signals? So you, somehow you were able to, to draw out and, and, and make, you know, uh, connect dots between these skills and the love of DJing and even law to entrepreneurship, how did you, yeah. how did you, like, tr how did that translate? Because it seems like quite a leap, right? Yeah. But, and you were able to, to identify these signals and see how they applied in other areas. How did you do that? So I, I, I don't necessarily, um, I didn't use these, these, I'm, I'm going to tell you sort of two philosophies that I think are interesting. I didn't use them, but now that I know them, I'm like, oh, that's sort of what I did. The first one is uh, Jim Collins, who's this incredible thinker. He wrote Good to Great and, and Great by Choice. Amazing man and incredible professor. But he talked about um, for a long time, every, at the end of every day, he would give himself a ranking of, I think it was minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. And he would just track it. And then he would go back after like 18 months of tracking daily. And this is basically, did he have a good day? Was it a good, did he enjoy it? Was it, did he feel productive? And so he gave himself sort of these, these five different, you know, you can have five different scores per day. And then he went back and he looked at, okay, what days over a course of 18 months or 24 months were my best days? And then he reverse engineered what he was doing on those days. Um, I didn't do that. I, I love that concept and I wish I would have done that, but I, I did sort of make sort of mental notes of the days that I thought. I was feeling at my best. I was feeling most engaged, most excited, most productive. I was having the biggest impact. And I just sort of noted, hey, like, that was a good day. What did I do again? Oh, you're right. Like, I, I, I helped a bunch of entrepreneurs. Oh, I, I, you know, spoke to the small business and helped them digitalize or whatever it was. So that's the first one. The second one that I also did not use, but now that I, I understand the philosophy, I think it's so important. It's, it's a Japanese term called ikigai, I believe, which means a reason for being. And um, it's this really cool, you can just, anyone can just Google this ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I, -I, but it really does, um, it helps to uh, assess um, what do you love? What does the world need? What can you be paid for? And what are you good at? And if it's two of those things, like for example, what are you good at and what can you be paid for? Well, then it's a profession. And what the world needs and what can be paid for, it's a vocation. Uh, what do you love and what the world needs? Well, that's a mission. And then I think finally it's like, what do you love and what are you good at? Well, that's passion. But if you can actually put together, what do you love? What does the world need? What can you be paid for and what are you good at? The centerpiece of that Venn diagram overlap is this idea of ikigai, reason for being or what I would call life's work. And um, I think more and more uh, for me, and, and I think for a, a lot of entrepreneurs, this is this, 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 by the way, this is incredibly privileged. I mean, we're like the privilege in like, that, that you can actually, um, curate your career, your profession based on something you love. I mean, my grandfather and grandmother did not have that opportunity. They literally had one vector in making a decision, which was, is it going to pay me? yes or no, it's binary. It's going to pay. Great. I'll do the job. It's not going to pay me. I won't do the job. But now folks like you and I, Brian, we can say, okay, well, how does this all fit together? And so, um, even though I didn't use either the, the minus one to minus two to plus two with the Jim Collins style, or even do a real Ikigai analysis, I think I always had elements of that as I was thinking about what I wanted to do. And entrepreneurship to me was, it was just, you know, if you said, Hey, stop working, we're never, you're never getting paid again. What would I do as a hobby? It would be entrepreneurship. You know, on the side, my wife and I opened, uh, and she takes more credit for this than I do, but we opened an ice cream shop because we wanted ice cream in our community. And she's like, you know what? I'm just going to open an ice cream shop. And we, you know, we noticed that there was not uh, a Jewish community center in downtown Ottawa. So we created a Jewish community center. Even though some of these things feel like a small business creation or may feel like philanthropy or charity, 
it's just us being entrepreneurial. And I think what entrepreneurship is, is being really, really resourceful, uh, finding creative problems, uh, creative solutions to problems that you want to solve. So I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily overly intentional about it, but all these little breadcrumbs, I kind of picked up and said, Oh, I like DJing. Well, why do I like that? Oh, I understand because I actually can, can change someone's energy. I can change their mood. I can give them something that maybe they didn't know they needed and make their life a little bit better. And why do I, why, why have I devoted my life to Shopify? Because what Shopify is, is effectively just giving people the tools that traditionally they did not have. And they use those tools to share their gift with the world, whether it's a skateboard that they're deeply passionate about, or it's this amazing food product that they love, or it's a cool t-shirt that they made, whatever it might be. The fact that people can use Shopify to share their gifts with the world, that lines up perfectly in my ikigai, in, in my version of, of how do I find my own, uh, how do I redefine or find my purpose? Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think uh, our Venn Vin diagrams, you and I, uh, you know, I see a lot of crossover. So on, on my uh, dad's side, uh, we're Jewish immigrants, came over uh, around 1891 to New York. Uh, I don't know what they did in the old country. I think they might have been tailors, but mm -hmm. um, they came and they were corn farmers. I have this amazing picture of uh, great, great, great grandfather Chaim with his beard down to here, flanked by his two sons with pitchforks in front of like 15 foot high corn stalks. Wow. Uh, and they helped uh, families assimilate as they came over from, you know, the old country to... The United States through Ellis well, Island. What was the old country for them? Was it was it Europe? Yeah. So uh, the borders at the time were probably somewhere around Poland or Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, called. Yeah, Romania and Hungary also were sort of at that point. It was it was sort of unclear what side you were on as well. But Poland, and Ukraine, uh, it sounds like that'd be the same thing. Also, it's like it's somewhere in that region. Yeah. 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 So so that's familiar. And then Ikigai that rings my bell because I was fascinated with Japan uh, at high school, and so. I went to study in Japan for a couple of awesome. years and um, I learned that term really quickly and um, and that's sort of my mission if you read you know the about page on the, the behind the brand page it talks all about Ikigai so uh, that resonates with me I appreciate you saying that what do you think gets people stuck you know um, we have all these best intentions we want to start our new business or even if we're starting a, hide, uh, a side hustle what gets small business owners and entrepreneurs stuck? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, one is, I think, uh, bad information. And, 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 and bad information comes from a couple different places. Um, you may meet, you may say, you may decide, hey, I'm going to start a business. And then randomly you're at a coffee shop or you're at a, you know, an event or something, or I don't know, you just, you read an article and it's about how m most small businesses fail. And then you say, you know what? I'm not going to even start right now because most business, it's true. Most small businesses do fail. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't try because most small businesses fail. Just, you know, just because I'm never going to be the fastest runner in the world doesn't mean that I should never run. Uh, I get a lot of enjoyment out of running. I may never be, you know, like run a marathon or win a marathon, but I get, I get something out of running. It clears my head. It makes me feel good. It's just, there's, there's a lot of benefits to it. So that definition of failure to one may be complete success to another. I, you know, I, I'm very close with some of the big success stories on Shopify, the homegrown success stories, the gym sharks or the fashion novas or the Allbirds or the Bombuses, like these companies that started their mom's kitchen table on Shopify and are now literally the category leader, right? Billion dollar brands that were built in five or six years on Shopify. And for them, their, the, their version of success was to be this incredible brand to, you know, in the case of Allbirds, to create a product that is not only environmentally friendly, but encourages more people to think about sustainability. Um, and that was their definition of success. But if I were to sort of, you know, if my def definition of success is, I just want an ice cream shop in my community. So my friends and my, my kids can go to a great ice cream shop. I don't have to make a million dollars with that ice cream shop. That's not success. Success is a very individual personal thing. And if success for you is just I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share delicious ice cream with my neighbors. Well, you're, you can be a success and not have to make a million dollars. 
So that's the one, the bad information, uh, that's the bad information I talk about that people often use their own perspectives and, and sort of, in, and, and, and put those perspectives on others, even though the other person they're putting the perspective on may have a completely def different definition of success. One of my favorite stores on Shopify, it's not a huge store, but it's a great brand is Mike D's barbecue sauce. Uh, it's out of Durham, North Carolina, the most delicious barbecue sauce I think ever. When you talk to Mike D around about his barbecue sauce company and you ask him why he did it. He'll talk about the fact that he, you know, he makes great barbecue sauce and want to share it with the world, but he also had, had never, um, he had never known anyone that had a family business. And this idea that his two daughters could potentially have an opportunity to go into the family business. That's why he's doing it. That's it. Um, yes, he's making money and yes, he's sharing his amazing barbecue sauce with the world. And, and lucky for me, he does that, but his version of success is about the family business that he always sort of just, he, he always looked at and saying, wow, wouldn't that be cool if I had a business to go into? That was my, that was part of a family legacy. And so he, that's, that's why he's creating it. That's the first one. The second one I think that people get wrong is the cost of failure. I think that when you go back to my grandfather go back to your family who started, you know, came over as immigrants, if the, you know, if the farm, um, the corn farm or the egg stand, if that failed, that would put your family and my family in a position of peril. They would be, in the case of my family, because I can speak directly to it, it would mean not eating that night. It would mean not being able to pay rent that night. Whereas now, you don't have to mortgage your life, your house, take out massive loans, beg and plead with the bank to give you some startup capital. Today, whether you do it on Shopify or elsewhere, I, mean, I think Shopify is better, but, but, but you can do it elsewhere. For $29, you can build a business, and that business may become a one or two or $10 billion brand competing with Nike the way Gymshark is. And that idea that the cost of failure keeps getting smaller and smaller, that is something that I also think people don't understand. And then probably the third thing, which is almost, you know, just very common sense is that idea of, of adaptability. Um, when COVID hit March, 2020, so almost a year ago to the day, what, what, what we saw was two different types of entrepreneurs, two different types of people, actually. We saw folks that reacted by saying, all right, new information is in. I need to change some things around. Um, I don't need to live in my 400 square foot apartment anymore, downtown Ottawa. I can move to the suburbs and have a bigger house in the backyard because I don't have to commute anymore to, to the office. You saw companies, restaurants saying, I'm going to, I'm going to create the best meal kit takeout business ever. Um, and you saw, you know, uh, hair salons start doing online courses to teach yourself how to cut your own hair if that's what you want to do. So you saw some of these entrepreneurs and these people being really resilient. They saw this tidal wave and they grabbed their surfboard, but you saw others that were incredibly um, they waited for the status. They're waiting for the status quo to continue. They didn't grab the surfboard and surf when they saw the tidal wave. They ran to the shore and grabbed their towel. And that I think is if you can be adaptable to any circumstance, any environment, regardless of what's getting thrown your way, because most of these things are out of your hands, you are going to be set up not just as an entrepreneur or a small business owner, or you're going to be set up as a, as a, as a great human, because no matter what happens to you, you understand that you have the opportunity and the, and you have the, um, you, you can react to it. I mean, this is, you know, this is classic Victor Frankl. Um, and, and what he talks about man's search for meaning is great book where somehow because being in a concentration camp in the Holocaust, he felt that he had a role in his case, it was to help, uh, people that were sick as, as sort of a doctor. But that meaning gave him a totally different perspective about life and, and having meaning in life. And I, I'm inspired by, by those types of stories. Yeah, again, uh, a treasure trove of advice there that I'll just go back and highlight a little bit. Um, my daughter asked, or she made a comment, um, you know, she's trying to figure out her purpose and what she wants to do. She's a teenager. And um, she said, Dad, it seems like you really love risk. You know, you, you, I used to work for the studios. You know, I had a big kind of corporate job um, at Universal Pictures and a big salary, all the health benefits. You know, I had, I was, it was really a cushy job. And then I cut the cord in about 2008 to start this startup. And as she's looked at me, she said, man, you, you, you must really love risk. You're fearless. And I said, well, no, <laughs> actually, it's just the opposite. Like, I think, and I can kind of speak for other entrepreneurs who I've spoke with, like we love to mitigate risk. So my risk taking is very calculated. And what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do is 
is like uh, make that delta a lot closer so that it's not a leap of faith that maybe I, I'll take a leap to my death, but like I want to just take a little hop onto the other side. And I appreciate, you know, platforms like Shopify. I don't want this to be a tongue bath, you know, where I'm, I'm just sort of blowing smoke, but like, you know, sites like yours and tools like other people have created for entrepreneurs make it so easy and they, they, they do make that delta a lot smaller so that you can just throw up a little shop and sell your product or service like that with very little risk. Because uh, I think, you know, some people, uh, they do go all in and, mm -hmm. and I would not recommend that, right? It's like if, if you're betting all or nothing – and you can't come back and fight another day if you lose that battle. That is not a battle you want to fight. The well, I would actually say you're working at a big studio. To me, uh, uh, in a job that you didn't love, that actually is far more high risk than what you're doing right now. Yeah. Because well, what that, the, the, the downside or the cost of, of failure in that job is you may actually change your entire relationship with yeah. your work. Well, Your to be work clear, may now become this nine to five thing, which actually to me is like a huge failure. I mean, that, that would be that, that that is the biggest risk you can. It, it'd be like me being a lawyer practicing yeah. law. I yeah. could do it, but the risk there would be massive because all of a sudden now I have my life, this hobby, the stuff that I love, and then and then I'd spend eighty percent of my waking hours doing something I didn't love. There's no way that 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 would be healthy. Well, I want to talk about that because that's a re that's a really good point, and I sort of want to argue. The other side of the coin, even though I am the coin, I, I would I, mm -hmm. I'll talk about both sides. So, I really loved my experience at a big company. I loved working at Universal because I, I got a ton of experience. I had a forty million dollar PNL. I had a big budget. Um, I spent a lot of the studio's money, and I learned everything about marketing and advertising I could. I also learned about uh, politics, you know, uh, corporate politics, and working with people, working with teams, managing teams, working with celebrities, um, technology. And this is actually where I also learned about production because when I got a chance to be in the studio uh, to create original content, I found myself sitting across from Robert De Niro in a director's chair with camera right. Uh, so cool. Asking Bobby De Niro, what did you eat for breakfast uh, when you were getting in that method acted role for Raging Bull, this boxing movie, you know? Uh, and that's when the light bulb went on for me, like, hey, this production thing, being a director is kind of fun. I think that's what I want to do in my next chapter. So I couldn't be here without being there, if that makes sense. Like, I needed to go through that process to get to where I am. So if I'm going to add my two cents to anyone who cares, I think first trying stuff on for size to see if it fits it's a great exercise and you should try lots of things, especially when you're younger. But also, you know, if you're looking back on a job that you may have hated or you might have thought, oh, I stayed there way too long. I also believe that nothing goes to waste, that, you know, you can take and draw from those experiences now because I am definitely seeing it in hindsight. Like, oh, man, I learned that like 10 years ago, and now it's becoming valuable. And now you could apply it. And now the key that you're talking about is, is sort of the way that I look at law school, which is that it depends what, it, it depends the reason you're doing it. So we talk a lot about uh, at Shopify that, that we believe that failure is the successful acquisition of something that didn't work. So the, if you sort of use that lens that everything you do that may have felt like a failure or may have not been the right thing actually was an acquisition of something, some new insights, new piece of information, a new piece of context, a new way of thinking about a problem. It means that as you go and you accumulate these failures, you're actually accumulating more context for, for whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing next. And, and that I think is a really great, you know, optimistic way to think about your life. Um, but I, but back to that risk comment and what your what your daughter is talking about i think also the yes entrepreneurs people that are entrepreneurial tend to be more uh tend to be less risk adverse more risk preferring and i think that's true but remember though that that a lot of like like there are now guardrails around this you don't you know i'm not necessarily suggesting that if you want to start a business you should you know, take a fourth mortgage on your house and pour it all into the company. That's actually the best part of being an entrepreneur in 2021 that our our predecessors in 
the year 2000, the year 1980, the year 1960, anytime before that didn't have where, think about it, Just let's just use retail. If you want to experiment with a store and a product and a brand, um, the online way to do it is set up a store, great, get a great theme, get a great product, write some product descriptions, create some content, some video, you have that store. And if it works, you scale it. If it doesn't, you shut it down. In the physical world, to do that, you have to go to a location. You have to get a lease. Uh, a lease is going to be a minimum of 12 months. Usually, it's closer to 24 to 36 months. You need to do leasehold improvements to build the store, actually like build the store. You have to hire staff. You need inventory. And if it doesn't work- Carry the insurance. <laughs> uh, exactly. I mean, I was going to go deeper than that, but yes, you need insurance. There's, just, there's all this stuff that is required, right? I mean, just payroll in itself. You're going to need to hire someone. You're not going to be able to be in the store by yourself all the time. So just that in itself means that entrepreneurship now is so much more accessible than it's ever been. And technology is a massive catalyst for that. It's one of the reasons that you know when people talk about technology- you know, they talk about the fact that you know some there are parts of tech that may not be as great. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of pros and cons to things like social media. On on my side, I've been able to connect with people like you, Brian, that I never would have connected with if not for the internet. Like the internet is this new, incredible, wonderful city in in our mind, in my mind, that is 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 brand new, and it means that we're all closer and we can connect with more like minded people, and it's so dynamic. Um, but that those examples of, of starting a brick and mortar store versus starting a digital store and being able to get information and pivot and adapt. And it's just the, the risk tolerance required is very different, which means that there's no better time maybe in the history of the planet to be an entrepreneur than right now. Yeah, that right there. And I can see the same for filmmaking. It used to be the gates are high. There was gatekeepers. Totally. The cameras were- You don't have were... to ask permission anymore, right? Permission is over. You do not need to ask permission to be a filmmaker in yeah. 2021 yeah. or an entrepreneur. Well, and you the cameras, the cameras were thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Now, you know, this camera, you know, uh, which is under $1,000, it shoots, I mean, you'd Beautiful. be hard, right. hard pressed to tell the difference between, you know, this big camera and this little tiny iPhone. So- mm -hmm. You are absolutely right. We're on the same page that now is the best time. And if you if you push back and if you're watching this and you say, oh, well, it's already been invented. It's already been done. Not true. Um, if you think, you know, there's a there's a sea of voices and people have already, you know, taken the space. Not true. There's always room for you. And and I'm a believer in in niche businesses. You talk about some of those superstars on Shopify it's a very niche business, you know. We're, we're not talking about, you know, uh, cheeseburgers uh, for the world. We're talking about like, you know, very specific niche businesses. And, and I'm a I'm a firm believer in in niching down at least at first, mm -hmm. even though your product might be broadly appealing, or have the potential to scale, you know, to infinite numbers. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Um, yeah, and I will say one more thing, sort of put a capstone on um, working for someone else. So <laughs> two quotes come to mind. One is from my mentor, Seth Godin, who reminded me that he said, Brian, you know, sometimes playing it safe is the riskiest thing you can do. And, and I didn't believe that until 2008 when, you know, uh, the world came crashing down for me. I, th I thought that, you know, the pattern, going to school, getting your piece of paper, going to work for someone and then staying there forever was the pattern. And then, you know, that proved to be wrong. Um, and then the other quote I can think of is uh, when uh, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank said to me, a salary is the drug they give you to forget your dreams. <laughs> I, just thought, and, and I, I know Kevin and Seth very well. Seth's also a mentor of mine, and I think that that is the most Kevin thing I've ever heard. And, and but it's true. It, it's 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 this it's this thing that you you get on this hamster wheel, and it's very tough to get off of it. So I guess you know uh, I, I I appreciate you weighing in on this. I'll I'll also add my two cents that um, I can co-sign what Seth said for sure because I I really thought that I was safe, and then it turns out that I was not, mm -hmm. and I am now. You know, I'm the author, basically, of, of my fate. You know, um, I'm the hero when I succeed. I am the, you know, I'm at fault and accountable when I fail. Um, I will give lots of other people credit for my success, as well as luck, divine power, etc. 
I can't claim all of it, but I am oddly a lot more comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, being more in control uh, of, of, you know, my future. And even if it's uh, a side hustle, you know, so this entrepreneur stuff is not for everyone. You know, Kevin will say the salary is the drug, but it's like, you know, sometimes it's okay to go work for someone else um, and also build a side hustle. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, this, this entrepreneur stuff is not for everyone. And like you said, you know, don't go quitting your day job if, if you're not ready. You know, don't go all in if it's going to, you know, put you out of business or cause you to lose your house or your family. I don't think that's what we're saying. And, I, and actually, what you're, what you're describing is really it takes this full circle back to the beginning of the conversation around self-awareness. Do you know what your ikigai is? Do you know what you love doing? Do you know what you need in your life? Do you know what you need to be your best version of yourself? Um, that I think that that self-awareness is so important. And, and, and so most people, you know, will, if you have this great job that you absolutely find to be, um, I'm not even going to say you're passionate about it. Forget passion for a second, but like you have a great job. You like it. You enjoy it. You think you're making a contribution. The the compensation, your salary you're getting from it gives you everything you need in your life. There is no reason to go and quit that job. That's not what I'm suggesting. Oh, let's face what it. Yeah. Let's, let's face it. There's a lot of employees at Shopify <laughs> who are working for a great company. And I, have- I work. I, I'm an employee at Shopify. And and for me, this idea of, of working at a company whose entire business model is 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 predicated and focused on helping other people find their own independence. Man, sign me up. I'm in. Uh, I'm in for life. It's a fr- shop is really the first job I've ever had, and probably the last job I ever, I'm ever going to have because the values of the company are so close to my own values, and 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 what I would be doing on my own is so close to what I'm doing at Shopify. And so rather than six thousand of us all individually trying to contribute to this mission of spreading entrepreneurship. What if we all aggregated our efforts together? What would happen if we all did this together? Well, the, the end result is we can create 1.7 million businesses. And now as we sit here, Brian, every 28 seconds, a brand new entrepreneur gets their first sale on Shopify. I couldn't do that alone. Each of us alone couldn't do that. But getting all together and doing it, that actually is possible. And I also want to just mention that I think that that is another area of confusion for a lot of folks, which is that you can work at a company and be an entrepreneur. I am an entrepreneur and I work at Shopify and I love working at Shopify. And I, I'm sure the majority of people that work at Shopify would also, also self-identify as an entrepreneur. And you may have had that opportunity working in a big studio also. So the two are not mutually exclusive. The key though is to, to be intentional about it, to not sleepwalk through a career and then to realize, oh my God, I've spent my last 10 years doing something I didn't really love. That is not, that's not necessary. And nor do I think that is the way that you share your own gifts with the world. Yeah. And you've also uh, talked about these side hustles that you have, whether it's the ice cream shop or the, or the Jewish community center. Right. Those are side hustles, yep. you know? Um, and, and I would encourage anyone to always have a side hustle and it, you know, these could be passion projects that grow into full-time projects. You just never know. Um, but I think they're worth doing. Yeah. Let's switch gears. Finally, you know, this show is called behind the brand. Um, I always like to talk about brands. So uh, how would you describe the Shopify brand? Let me also give you some context. You know, I, I've learned from many of the masters, you know, whether it's Seth Godin or Marty Neumeyer, who's talked a lot about branding, um, and sort of talk about what a brand is not. You know, a brand is not your logo. Mm-hmm. Brand is not your product or service. Um, but how would you how would you describe the Shopify brand? I think a brand actually is 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 the way you feel when you encounter or you um, when you interact with that company, with that thing, and that product. That that sort of that feeling, I think, is is what brand is. And I think what Shopify's brand is is this idea of um, making something and sharing with the world, making that process approachable. You know, Nike did this amazing thing. Nike's one of the best brands on the planet, but Nike did this great thing where Nike said this: if you have a body you are an athlete. And why was that such an important message of brand? Because it meant that Nike's products were now accessible to anybody. You didn't have to be a professional quote unquote athlete to use their products. What we're trying to do at Shopify is we want to, we want to convince people that if you have ambition, you could be an entrepreneur. 
And then once you agree, once you sort of go down that path, here is everything you need to be successful. So, you know, our mission is to make commerce better for everyone, but that's not our brand. Our, you know, some of our values are, you know, to spread entrepreneurship, but that's not our brand. The, our brand, I think, is this idea of creating independence, that we can give you something that hopefully allows you to share your gift. Maybe you make delicious meat sauce, or maybe you make great shirts, or maybe you you're, you knit these beautiful blankets. Whatever your thing is, Shopify wants to help you share that gift with the world. And if you can make, if you build a billion dollar brand, cool. If you can uh, put food on your table, cool. If all it is is you like the idea that you are sharing ice cream uh, with your community, that in itself is good for us. But our we want people to look at Shopify and use Shopify and feel like, wow, this feels like magic. This allows me to do something that I could never do on my own. And this allows me to better find my my life's work, to better seek out the thing that I want to share with the world and, and make that available. And then invite people, make it accessible for more people to participate in that. And we do that through the product. We want to make it really easy to start a business. If you know how to use email, you should be able to start a store on, Shop on Shopify within a couple of hours. Uh, we also want to do that with the way that we have pricing built in, that it should be very inexpensive, very affordable to get started. And only once your business grows, does the complexity of Shopify reveal itself. So very simple to use and simple to get started. But it also needs to be about the business model, that we are only successful, only successful when our merchants are successful. And therefore, we are on, we are in their corner. We're on the same side of the table as they are. And that, I think, is, is what our brand is. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up. Reminiscing about the good old days and all that, you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view. Uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Go, go, Backseat go. drivers got nothing but two cents. Whoop. Shotgun riders too biased, they all liars. I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired. But I'm never giving up, that's why I'm kinda admired. Role model, like it or not, I gotta play it. Sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes, but still say it. Said I was quitting at 40, it's just a fib. I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib. You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over everything. Every opportunity wasted. Yeah. Good and bad news, which one you want first? Either way, you pick the bad, still gonna hurt you the worst. Tell